but it doesn't give you confidence to stock up on euros. And, you know, for me, the way I'm playing it is I'm buying the top 50 European names in their local currencies, in Swiss francs, in euros and British pounds. Because... We haven't yet, um, particularly if this Build Back Better bill uh, prints another 400 to 600 billion dollars and flushes it right into the economy. That's probably not going to be a good outcome for inflation because it's very inflationary, even though it's been it's, it's trying to be labeled as an anti-inflation bill. Anytime right. you print, anytime you print money, you get inflation. So we'll see what happens. That's got to go through the gauntlet in Washington. That's one factor. The other that's really interesting that has um, a lot of market watchers really scratching their heads right now because it's never happened before. You've got a situation of full employment that's like 3.4 percent. And yet at the same time, a second quarter of GDP shrinking. That has never happened before. So one way to interpret that is to say the productivity of the two plus million new workers that have just been booked into the economy must be very, very low. Or maybe they're not really working eight hours. Maybe they're working less, but there's something not working to the traditional model, which is why I think it's giving Powell pause because he has been job owning a more dovish Fed, having just done the 75 basis points. Even he doesn't know what's happening here. So he's data dependent. We've never seen this before. Never, never in the history of the economy in 200 plus years has this ever occurred. So again, another sign that is not fitting with what everybody wants towards this recession, maybe. The narrative towards the soft landing has changed so much in the last eight weeks because just two months ago, nobody thought Powell could engineer anything like this. Yeah. And here we are. You, 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 it's very hard to call this a recession when you've got full employment. And so is this working? So at least 50% of the pundits or the market now believes the soft landing is possible. And again, a lesson learned for everybody who thinks they can time the market is, look what happened in July. You've got maybe half of the, this year's returns came in four days. And so if you weren't in the market, you're, you didn't capture that upside. And so it's impossible to time the market. You would have never guessed July would have been a good month, but it was. This is in the earnings. And so far, everybody was waiting to see earnings completely blow up. Didn't happen. Many companies delivered, even the highly speculative tech companies, and we're halfway, more than halfway through earnings season, and it looks pretty good. Now, it's not as good as it was a year ago, but it's nowhere near as bad as everybody was forecasting that we would be in the height of a recession right now, and we're not. And so th this is a very difficult time to make a decision between fixed income and equities because, you've, as you mentioned earlier in the show, we've got an inverted yield curve that's generally never good. But again, when you can't tell me why, we have full employment, two and a half more million people working and low productivity, then maybe you want to be a little careful about making more decisions about raising rates or changing policy or, or you know, raising taxes. They all sound like really bad ideas until you've really figured out the, ri the riddle of what's going on in this economy. We don't know. Exactly. So exactly. my attitude is to stay long equities, uh, continue at a 30% weighting in fixed income. That's very low for me. Usually it's 50% and just wait and see what happens. My names are high quality names that provide cash flow and distributions. But it doesn't matter what sector you pick. You've been doing quite well in the last four weeks. Everybody likes to beat up the Fed regardless of who's in that seat. But he's been doing a really good job because, and in my view, because he just doesn't know and doesn't say that he knows what's gonna happen next. So he's trying to stay flexible. Rates right now are still at historic lows, even though he's gone through multiple rate hikes. The question is now, what's next? Many people think, well, another one is going to be at 1%, and maybe there'll be an emergency meeting, but I don't think so. He's in the same boat as everybody else trying to figure out where are we in this recession? Is it going to be maybe two or three quarters of slower growth or no growth? We haven't really called it yet because it's so perplexing to have this much employment. For every job, you know, out there in America that, that, that is available, there's a ton of people that don't want it. I mean, you, you can't hire anybody anymore, which is incredible. And, you know, minimum wages in California, 15 bucks for service providers, maybe in the food industry, you can't get anywhere 15 bucks, 21, 22, 23 right now. So yeah. the economy is self-adjusting. There is a ton of people that just don't seem to want to go back to work.
I see Bitcoin sort of uh, testing 20,000 all the time, getting a lot of resistance there, seems to be holding the 20 23 area. Still very profitable for Bitcoin miners that are currently mining at about uh, 7,000 per coin at scale. And so there has been a knee-jerk reaction against Bitcoin miners lately because of ESG concerns, but they're also self-correcting by getting into nuclear and hydropower, which you know is, a, is plentiful in some mm -hmm. countries like Norway. Now, crypto itself desperately needs policy. It needs regulation. And there was a bill just two weeks ago that was contemplated being pushed through, not on Bitcoin, just stable coins as payment systems. And as you know, that's been a very volatile area. That bill, that initiative has been stalled till September. But I think there's a 50-50 chance that we will have policy on basically stable coins tied to the U.S. dollar. And let me explain specifically why I think it's going to happen. There is a turf war going on between the SEC and every other regulator as regards to crypto, NFTs, tokens, all of this stuff. And so the smart regulators, the policymakers are saying, well, wait a second, let's pick one outcome. Let's just do payment systems, just like a credit card, a Visa card, or a money market fund, which has very you know, limited flexibility in terms of what you can hold in it, basically T-bills and dollar for dollar cash. Same thing with a payment system like a stable coin. If that policy comes down, let's say it gets done in September, that's a signal to the market that we're starting to break open the log jam on policymaking. And I'm very, very optimistic. In fact, on August 3rd, I'll be addressing the bipartisan legislature in Colorado, on specifically in Denver, on this issue. Very rare to get all of the policymakers in one room, both sides of the aisle and their staff. This is what they want to talk about, the digital economy and policy on digital currency. I'm one of the people going there to address them. I'm very proud to be doing it. But the point is they want policy. We're finally getting something to happen yep. here, I think. We took a hit. We were at 20, and then it grew up to 23%. Then it went down to 16% of the, of, the, of the portfolio. I mean, it was really volatile. But I've always said, you're going to get this volatility in an ASN industry that's not regulated because there's no institutional bid. So probably at the low, we were at 15%. We lost you know, 40% of the value. And now we've come back up on some projects. And they haven't all come back at the same pace. You know, the big players, the big market cap names like Bitcoin, like Ethereum, like Solana, like Polygon, HBAR, you know, in some cases we doubled down. We took advantage of the extreme volatility in the large cap names like ETH and like Bitcoin. Why not add to the position uh, if you're going to stay long? But, you know, everybody trying to manage this space, I don't care who you are, if you tell me you made money in the last 90 days, I know you're lying. You've lost money and you're just averaging down, hoping for this to climb back up. If you'd own these positions for more than two years, you're basically in a break-even situation. So this asset class is not correlated with anything, uh, as people thought. It's not correlated with inflation yet. But the real problem, and every time you and I talk about this, it's really a gauge on where the institutional buyer is. And yep. right now, zero. They have no Bitcoin. Anybody that tells you the institutions, the sovereigns own it, is full of poo-poo. I'm in that camp that says dollars, uh, king dollar is going to be stronger. Euro is going to probably, worst case, go to 80 cents. I mean, look, they've got lots of external issues there that we don't deal with here. We got, they have the Putin factor, the energy factor, uh, how screwed up Germany is in shutting down all its alternative power. They did that to themselves. That's a self-inflicted wound. Uh, the Ukraine, the grain situation, the market knows all these factors, but it doesn't give you confidence to stock up on euros. And, you know, for me, the way I'm playing it is I'm buying the top 50 European names in their local currencies, in Swiss francs, in euros and British pounds. Because if you look at a Nestle or you, you look at American tobacco or a Roche, half their sales, in some cases, more than half are in the United States. And now you get to buy them in their local currency at massive discounts, PE discounts and currency discounts. So why not take down a little bit of Europe? And I've increased that position for me specifically to 20% of the operating company's portfolio. Europe, European names, mega caps, big cash flowers, selling at huge discounts. Everybody hates the European zip code right now. I have. I've added a little gold and I'm using the GLD, which is an expensive ETF, but it's liquid enough. You can put millions in, in and out in, a, in an hour and not move the market. 
uh, and, and gold bullion itself, I can still keep in storage and pay for the storage. But it's, look, it hasn't worked either. And gold may be the canary in the bird, you know, the canary in the coal mine that basically yeah. tells you that peak inflation has been found. And, and we've seen it because so much of it is, is disruption of supply chain and disruption of food supply chains. So right now, uh, gold as an indicator is, is not, uh, is not doing what it should be if you really believe we're going into hyperinflation. Sounds like gold is pretty proud of power. And saying, you know what? Maybe he's he's got he's engineered a soft landing because it's not been a great asset class of late. Maybe, but you, the same thing's happening in Texas. There seems to be a bias in housing now to states that are pro economy, pro business, pro low taxes, pro low regulation. Those are the states of of uh, Texas and and Florida, uh, Montana, North Dakota. You know, these pockets seem to have really buoyant housing market and rental markets, which is you've never seen that before. It used to be, you know, New York City and Jersey. I wouldn't want to be long really high end real estate in New York that, or New Jersey. There's an exodus out of there. And, you know, this is the competition of policy. And I think it's good. Wait till we see what the midterms are going to bring. That's going to be really, Not really interesting for, for Biden. And my yeah. goodness, I'm not sure he'll hold the Senate even. So I've been listening to this dialogue now for a year uh, about how watches are going to roll over. It simply hasn't happened but because the demand for, um, you know, watch pieces, particularly the brands uh, Rolex, FP Journe, uh, AP, even Omega recently has had a huge run. Now, they're, they're off their peaks, but you're, if you've owned these watches for 24 months, it's still out pace the S&P. It's still outpaced crypto. It's the best asset class to have been in in the last two years. Rolex just dropped the new GMT uh, 2 with the, the, the bezel on the left-hand side, which is like a funky chicken thing to do. And so it's now been named the Riddler in, in the aftermarket. You're, you're up 40, 50% if you can get your ha hands on one. And that's a 2002 release. So there's no evidence at all that secondhand watch pricing is going to have a massive correction. It, it has gone down 14%. And by the way, I watch these prices nightly. I watch what's going on in watches everywhere. I'm very comfortable it's going to continue to rise and beat the market. There, there are, um, you know, I, I have to admit I've, I've got to the point in my career where most of the brands are willing to make one of a kind Mr. Wonderfuls for me. And my policy is always, I don't give me anything for free. I don't want to owe anybody anything. I will buy the pieces. But one-of-a-kind pieces from an FP Journe, one-of-a-kind from, uh, you know, Adam Piquet or, or, or any of the one-of-a-kind from any brand uh, is priceless. And my wife is always saying, who's the guy at the Phillips auction house? Because when you die, the, I don't need all these watches. I, I'm going to put on a huge auction. And I say to her, no, you're not going to do that. That guy is Paul Boutros. I said, all these watches are coming in my coffin with me, just like the Pharaohs, because I'm going to need a really good timepiece in eternity. Think about it. 